Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Tuesday, March 26, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we prepare for another trading day ahead. Hard to believe, March almost over. I mean, this is March 26th. Uh, by the time we get to the end of this week, March 29th, that'll be it. We start next week, go into a second quarter, go into a new month, a new week, uh, and uh, start pointing toward a couple things. Number one, we start pointing toward earnings season, uh, which uh, at that point would only be a couple weeks away. And uh, for me personally, getting closer to Masters, the Masters, big golf tournament. That's one of my favorite times of the year. I love springtime. Love uh, to see those guys compete uh, for uh, the Masters Championship. Uh, so again, that's coming up in just a couple of weeks as well. But anyhow, uh, futures, getting back to the stock market. Uh, right now, we got futures up across the board. Um, I'll give you some actual numbers <clears throat> by looking at the ETFs that track the major indices. Right now, we have the diamonds, which track the Dow Jones, up about uh, uh, a little more than one-tenth of 1%. S&P 500, which is tracked by the spider, the SPY, that's up almost three-tenths of 1%. Then we look at the QQQ, uh, which is up um, about one-third of 1%, very similar to the S&P 500. And then finally, the IWM, which tracks the uh, Russell 2000, that's up about two-thirds of 1%. Uh, currently in pre-market, up around the 207 level. Remember, 208.21, that's the level I'm watching on the IWM. Small caps uh, threatening that breakout. If they can get it, then we're looking at the next uh, significant high up around the 225 level. So uh, it's going to be really important to see uh, that breakout on the IWM. We got up past it on, uh, was that Friday? Uh, couldn't quite sustain it, though. We ended up coming back down, closing below that key resistance level. Yesterday went down a little bit. We started up in the, in the morning, had a nice little pop first thing in the morning. This seemed to like drift lower slightly throughout the rest of the day. And then we saw a little bit of selling pick up into the close. And now today it looks like uh, Groundhog Day. We've got um, got action again, taking off to the upside. The question is, is it gonna stick? Do we get through resistance? Are we just gonna chop? Um, can't answer that question. We'll have to watch the action today to find out. But uh, we are consistently now bumping up against that 208.21 level. So that's uh, something to watch. If you're a small cap fan, and small caps are one area that I'm expecting, <clears throat> excuse me, to show a little bit more leadership as we uh, move throughout 2024, um, and as we get closer and closer to interest rate cuts, I think that will help trigger some of the small and mid-sized banks uh, more so to the upside, and that would help the small caps. That's one of the uh, uh, most highly represented areas within that IWM is the small and mid-cap bank area. So that's something to keep an eye on. So I'm watching interest rates. I think 10-year treasury yield staying up is okay. I'm I'm actually trying to be a little bit more open-minded. Um, I know we've had, you know, there's some things that have happened because of COVID um, and because of the shutdown, kind of like inflation. That was one big thing that kind of came out of nowhere and it came because of the, uh, because of COVID. Um, and so, I know a lot of uh, folks, when they look at the market, think very short term. In other words, they can't get past. They don't think beyond the last couple of years. So whatever's been happening seems like it's what always happens. It's not the case. Things there, you, You've got to make sure you keep perspective. But anyway, we'll talk about uh, the 10-year Treasury yield in just a minute. But let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what happened on Monday. So we got the Dow Jones Industrial Average finishing down 162 points. That was uh, down about four-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 down 16, that was about three-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 fell 62, that was down uh, again about one-third of 1%. Mid-cap stocks, though, were uh, flat on the session, and, and the IWM small caps actually gained about a quarter of 1%. Uh, that difference between those various indices was much greater at the open, though. Um, the IWM got off to a really good start. The NASDAQ, the S&P all gapped down, so we had a pretty wide margin at the open and by the end of the day, small caps were still leading, but that that uh, advantage had narrowed quite a bit. And uh, I don't like to see that. I mean, it's just one day and it wasn't a lot. 
but it's that intraday action that I'm kind of watching pretty closely. It's why I created the user defined indices that I do or that I did um, because I wanted to track what happens during the day. Forget about the gaps. Gaps to me are just, that's to me, it's just manipulation. Up, down, whatever. Um, but what actually happens during the day, the trading, once the market opens and we get full liquidity, all the market makers participating, that's when I want to see, you know, whether prices are going up or down and how prices are relating to prices and other areas of the market. Uh, Intermarket analysis tells us a whole lot if we're willing to study and to listen to the story that's being told. So yesterday wasn't a great day for the IWM, even though it outperformed because it lost some of that relative strength throughout the day. So let's see what happens today. A breakout again on the IWM, along with some relative strength intraday, would really mean a lot to this group as we go forward. So that's what I'm watching for. Uh, transports. Remember, Transports uh, recently had that uh, piercing candle right at support at 15.4. That sent us all the way to 16.2. 800 points on the transportation index in about three or four trading days until we put in a black candle at resistance. And then after that, we pulled back. We'll look at that chart a little bit closer in just a few minutes. Moving on to the sectors, we had energy, utilities, materials leading to the upside yesterday. Two neutral groups, one defensive group. Um, not really a whole lot of anything. In fact, when I was looking at the market this morning, kind of recapping you know, all the different industry groups and all, there really wasn't a whole lot of big winners or big losers. It was just a you know, okay, we're up a little, you're down a little, and the market essentially went nowhere. Um, and that was the kind of day. So not really a whole lot of economic news out this week, not a lot of earnings news. And so the market is left to just trade based on technicals, which is a good thing because technicals are strong. But yesterday was just a day where we just kind of went sideways, really didn't do much of anything. Um, moving on to the industry groups, media agencies, got a, some different groups here. But media agencies, best performer, up 1.59%. Again, one and a half, 1 1.6% on the best industry group out of 104 industry groups isn't saying a whole lot. Um, then we had the reinsurance group, which was up a little bit more than 1.5%. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we had clothing and accessories. And that's uh, dictated a lot by what's going on with Lululemon. And Lululemon, as you probably know or may know, uh, their earnings report didn't come in too bad. Um, I think their guidance might have been a little bit light, but that's typical for that company. I, I think that they tend to, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They tend to um, undershoot, you know, going forward in terms of their revenues and earnings, and then they come in and beat. That's what the, that's their history. So I think some of what's going on maybe is a little bit overdone, but Nonetheless, Lululemon's been getting hit hard. And as a result, you can see clothing and accessories completely have broken down here over the last couple of days. 10-year Treasury yield. So uh, let's get an update here. Um, this morning, we have um, durable goods out. And the durable goods came in just slightly. New orders came in just slightly above expectations. 1.4% versus 1.3%. If we strip out the transports, they were exactly as expected, rising five tenths of 1%. So nothing really big there in terms of a earnings or an economic report that could shake the market or maybe, you know, light a little um, fire under the market. Really nothing like that. So not seeing much uh, really to drive the market here short term. Later this morning, we'll have the Case Shiller. Uh, actually, it comes out at nine. Maybe I have that. Let me see if that's out. It is out. <clears throat> so the Case Shiller Home Price Index for January, so this is looking back a couple months, um, but that rose 0.1%. The consensus estimate was for 0.2%. So it did come in slightly below expectations. Yesterday, new home sales came in slightly below expectations, even though the prior month um, was actually raised higher. So we had a revised number a little bit higher going back two months, but new home sales last month were a little bit less than expected. So, so far this week, been a little different than last week in that home, um, you know, anything related to the home construction market, home builders, this week so far has been just slightly disappointing. Whereas last month, or excuse me, last week, everything came in better than expected. It was a great week uh, to be in the home construction area. 
So that's kind of changed a little bit this week, but uh, again, nothing big. I mean, this isn't, we're not talking about a big miss on the uh, Case Shiller home price index. And again, this goes back to January. So we're talking about two months in our rear view mirror. Let's see anything else that, well, later this morning, we'll have consumer confidence out at 10 a.m. Um, the rest of the week, we do get GDP, the final reading of GDP on Thursday. Um, Personal income and spending is coming out on Friday, which is somewhat surprising. Uh, maybe it always does, um, if there, even if there is a, um, a holiday. But markets closed on Friday. This is a holiday shortened week. We've got Good Friday coming up. So uh, stocks will be closed on Friday, three-day weekend for all of us. Um, well, not really. We, I continue. I like to work. I, I, like, uh, I love what I do. So I, I keep doing stuff all weekend long with the stock market over my, my uh, Starbucks latte. But at least uh, we will have a long weekend for those of you who want to get out of town, just be safe in your travels. Uh, can't wait to see you again next Monday, but um, that's coming up later this week. So we've got a few days off to maybe uh, um, refuel. Uh, I'm not really seeing anything else though in terms of economic reports that are going to be mind altering, earth shaking. Uh, so um, we'll just deal with what we have, see if we get any kind of technical breakouts, but for the most part, I expect that we're going to see a lot of what we've been seeing, which is really slow, methodical gains. Um, every once in a while, get a little spike and then kind of settle down a little bit. That seems to be the market we're in. And this is what a bull market is made of. Secular bull market advances are very, very boring. I absolutely love them. And the reason I love them is because when you're holding stocks overnight, you don't wake up to futures being down 300 or 400 on the Dow. Um, instead, all right, maybe it's 20, 30 points here or there, maybe 50. Um, you know, there's just no impulsive moves, especially to the downside. Um, and that makes it so much easier for a short-term trader because there's not as much risk. I don't feel like when I go to bed at night, what am I going to wake up to? Um, and so I honestly like it a lot better. So I'm, Traders love the volatility associated with, you know, market panic. And that's not for me. I sit that out or if anything, I short it um, when the market's going through those stages. But volatility, I'm going to pull up a chart in a little bit. But volatility has been dwindling and actually is giving us a signal that this bull market is just getting started. But I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So today, right now, we've got the 10-year Treasury yield back to 426. It's up another basis point from where it was yesterday. I commented on this a little bit. I believe it was in the daily market report yesterday, but 10-year treasury yield just is not giving up. Um, it continues to meander to the upside. I see a, at least you've got to admit short-term uptrend in play here. I mean, but if we stretch this out and we go back uh, six years, last six years, I mean, you can see the uptrend is still in play. There's nothing here telling me that we are downtrending. In the 10 year treasury yield. So I'm trying to get my, you know, I'm trying to recalibrate, I guess, um, and understanding that rates right now, even at 4.25, 4.26%, are extremely low on a relative basis. Let me show you a long term chart on the 10 year treasury yield. So here is the monthly 10 year treasury yield going back. This is, 15 years, but I want to go back a lot further than that. Let's go back 50 years. And you can see, I mean, we continually were going down, 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 but look at where we are right now. And relative, yeah, we're higher than we've been probably over the last 10, 12 years. Um, but if you go back the 30 years prior to that, I mean, rates were always much, much higher and the market was doing fine back in the 80s and 90s. Um, it wasn't until 2000, right in here, when that secular bear market kicked in. But as we continue to go down, I mean, money's getting cheaper. It's, I think, certainly better for the economy. Now, if this continues going up, we got problems. This is one thing that would rattle my chain. Rattle, I would be rattled for sure. If we move up, continue moving up, and I would say to me, the number is somewhere in the 5 to 6% range. I mean, if we're over 6%, I think that would be bearish for stocks. I do not want to see 6%. Um, 
even with a strong economy, even if the, the economy were to strengthen, rates getting up there, probably that economic strength would not continue. And if it did, could trigger some, some more inflation problems. Don't want to see that. So with inflation coming down, I want to see the 10-year stabilize. Doesn't have to go down much. I don't need this, the 10-year treasury yield to go back down to a half percent or 1% to feel like that's what the mark, stock market needs. Stock market's fine operating at this level. It's done it many, 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 many years in the past at higher levels than this. So um, again, I'm trying to recalibrate and understand that, hey, maybe what's going to happen, and this would not be a, a particularly horrible thing, is for rates to kind of stay where they are on the long, long end, 10-year treasury yield, and then the Fed lowering on the short end. Because if we stay up here at about four, four and a quarter, four and a half percent on the 10 year, and then we start seeing the drops, that is going to uninvert our yield curve. And as a result, banks are going to see their net interest margins increase. And that, along with a decent economy, which has not triggered many loan losses, helps the banks recover without hurting our economy overall. So it would actually be kind of a nirvana for banks for the 10 year to sit about where it is right now and then to have short term rates coming down. So again, I'm kind of recalibrating to the idea that we this is a new normal. We're beyond, you know, we're now four years past the start, or almost four years past. Actually, we are four years past the start of the pandemic. That was in March 2020. It's March, late March 2024. Um, and I think things are starting to normalize. I mean, the last three years has been crazy. Rotation's been crazy. Trying to time that rotation's been crazy. Um, you know, inflation's higher than it's coming down. Uh, there was just a lot to try to, um, and it, it's just kind of had this domino effect going through almost er every area of our economy, impacting something uh, by a pretty significant amount at some point. And so anyway, I think the 10-year treasury, uh, my point is, I think we're okay where it is right now. I wouldn't want to see it go break busting through 5% and taking off. So I do want to kind of watch it, but I'd like to see maybe sideways action, maybe trade with the yield between five to the upside, maybe three and a half to the downside. I don't think that would be bad. In fact, I think that would be really good for the market. S&P 500, just continually moving up. I mean, not really a whole lot to say. I talk about this every show. And there's really not much to point out. We trade above the 20-day moving average. The 20-day moving average trades above the 50-day moving average. This is a very, very bullish picture. This is what you want to see. Prices above both key moving averages with the short term steadily rising above the longer term. I mean, this is nirvana. I mean, if you're holding in some good stocks right now, you're seeing those stocks for the most part week after week going higher and higher. So many people want to bet against it. Don't bet against it. The biggest, the number one signal in the stock market is a combination of price and volume. Forget about everything else. Everything else that's talked about is a secondary indicator. Everything else I talk about is a secondary indicator. Even the, you know, below this, beneath the surface signals following the intraday action on some of these intermarket relationships, secondary. Divergences, secondary. Breath, a lot of people like to talk about that. Secondary. Candlesticks, get a reversing candle. Secondary. What's price action doing? Unless you get an overwhelming number of secondary indicators, I mean overwhelming. I mean, everything you point to, it's like, oh my gosh, how are we going up because of this? What about this? What about this? Once you get all of those worries and they all come together, at that point, yeah, we probably that all of them together kind of outweigh price and volume, but you got to get them all going. You can't handpick one thing. And that's what I think a lot of folks do that are afraid of the stock market. They'll hear one story. Oh my gosh. You know, um, you know, this group's not participating. Or, oh my gosh, we got negative divergence. Um, that stuff happens all the time. It's noise. Follow the price action. Look at this price action and tell me what looks horrible about it. 
just continually trading above the 20, which is above the 50. I mean, at least see price action break down a little bit before you get bearish. As long as we just keep going up, what's the big deal? There isn't it. There isn't one. Follow the trend. NASDAQ 100, pretty much the same thing. We have seen a little bit of breakdowns. This has a history three or four different times now where we've broken below the 20-day, but that 20-day continues to trade above the 50. We continually manage to make our way back up, set new highs, continuing to trend higher. Uh, I do think that the NASDAQs come under a little bit more pressure on a relative basis, but that's good. All the folks worried about breadth. You don't have to worry about breadth as much anymore. We got a lot of different areas participating now. That should make them happy. The bears, those bears should be happy. Nope, they'll go on to something else. They'll find something else. And that's why you never get away from it. You've got to follow, follow that price action. Follow earnings beats. IWM. Uh, this one, like I said, uh, Friday, or actually I guess that was Thursday, where it tried to get through the 208.21 level. It was through it intraday. We got up, we finished. It looks like the right side of the cup has been established off of an uptrend. This was a bigger cup that we were looking at right here. Remember that? Big uptrend, cup, handle, breakout. Now on this move right here, we have another cup. And it looks like another handle forming. A breakout, this initial cup would uh, take us up to about, let's just call it 208, 209, down to 199. So maybe nine or 10 points. That initial measurement, I'm going to say somewhere around 217, 218. If you take the bigger cup right here, we're talking about 205 down to 187, 18. That gets us up to 223. So we got this one measuring on a breakout to 217, 218. The bigger cup measures 223. And if we pull up a long-term chart or longer-term chart, uh, you'll see, first of all, that that 235 level is ultimately the big level. But from a weekly perspective, what I like is that instead of all this sideways action where we can't hold on to moving averages as support, that's telling us that the market is directionless. It's not downtrending. I mean, here it looks, it was, came down, you failed to get through the 20, you went down, failed to get through the 20, went down again. I mean, that's a downtrend. But we broke that since then sideways. Now, what are we doing? Trending up, taking out triple top, pulling back. Now we're holding the 20 day or 20 week. So until you lose the 20 week moving average, you have to go with what the chart is telling you price wise. We're going higher. The signals, those daily cup with handle patterns tell us that we're going higher. One cup and handle there, breakout. Here's another cup handle forming. We'll see what happens with this one. I mean, the other thing is when you see this cup and handle, what you really want to see is lighter volume on the handle for the pattern. And these, number one, look at the gap downs. Do you see any big red-filled candles? And by the way, I'm going to have a, a course on Monday at 4.30 talking about candlesticks. Um, so when I get to earnings beats and I show you how to sign up for the EB Digest, if you want to come to that free event, sign up for the EB Digest. We'll be sending out uh, instructions to everybody in, our, in that community along with obviously all of our paid members. But if you want to learn more about candlesticks and why they're so important and what they tell you visually, make sure you come to the event on Monday. It's free. There's no credit card required, nothing. It's free. Sign up for the EB Digest and you'll be invited. Anyhow, um, but candlesticks tell me so much about the market. Um, and here, I think we're eventually going to get these breakouts that we're looking for. So the transports, I mentioned earlier, speaking of candlesticks, um, we printed that piercing candlestick, which is a bullish reversing candle off of a downtrend. There's your downtrend. There's your piercing candle. And it occurred right at price support, which is even better. And the, the reason it's better is that if it turns around and goes below this triple bottom, you can get out quickly if you want. Up to you. I mean, if this is the only signal that you're really relying on, then yes, I would get out. But if you believe that transports are kind of in this consolidation phase and eventually going to break out, then I'd probably give it down to 15.2. But this reversal occurred right at 15.4, moves up. Where did we hit? 16.2. What's our resistance? 16.2. What candle printed? A black candle 
Did it print off of an uptrend? Yes. And what happened yesterday after that? Went back down. Now, if we are starting this trend, if this is the move that starts the trend, what needs to happen at the moving averages? We need them to hold. Moving averages, when they hold and act as support, tell you that a trend is in play. If we go right back down through that those moving averages, then this trendless environment continues, which is frustrating. <clears throat> but that's the way it is. I mean, if you're a technician, you've got to look for the signals of an uptrend. That signal to me would be testing and holding the moving averages and going back up and breaking out. That's what we're looking for. Now, this is a daily chart. If you want to step back, because I think the further you step back, the bigger picture you're looking at, the more, you know, it's kind of like, <clears throat> you know, having a thousand piece puzzle and you put the first 500 pieces together. That's like the daily chart. You've seen, you know, you kind of get a visualization of what's going on in the puzzle, but you never really get a good view until all thousand puzzle pieces are put together. Then you can see, oh, that, yeah, that is exactly what that is. Anyway, as I go further and further out, that's what this is telling me. So now I'm going back out and I'm seeing, well, major uptrend back in 2020 through early, well, latter part of 2021. And then that's where all this sideways action uh, started and really has been um, hurting us. But we went down and it still, it looks like it's more of an uptrend than it is a downtrend at this point. So the 20 week moving average has held throughout this year all but one week. It was right there a couple of weeks ago. We went just slightly below, but we held on to price support. Came right back up above the 20 week. And so it, it has a little bit more of an uptrending feel on the weekly chart than it does say on the daily chart. Daily chart just seems like right now we can't get out of our way. PPO is sitting right near the zero line. It's just not a lot. You know, I, I just feel like 15.2 to 16.2 is our trading range until that breaks. It is off of an uptrend, so I expect it to break to the upside. That's what typically happens when you go through a consolidation phase. But we haven't gotten that breakout yet. We don't have confirmation yet. All right. Um, let's talk about um, how you sign up for that Earnings Beats uh, Digest newsletter first. Go to our homepage, earningsbeats.com. Check this out if you haven't already. We leave it up here because if you haven't downloaded, I don't know why. We're giving you plenty of opportunity. But the most shocking thing to me in the market was learning how history works and how history repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. Sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, sometimes annually. But you need to understand the history of the market and the way it operates. And if you get that, as part of your background and as part of your foundation and trying to understand the stock market, a lot of technical things start to make more sense. Click this download free report button and get this report and understand if you haven't already. Those of you who've been with us for a while at Earnings Beats knows that you all know a lot of these different historical trends that I talk about all the time. But if you're new, if you're watching this show for the first time, get that report. Um, but down here, you can subscribe to the EB Digest. Name and email address. We'd love to have you. And we will be reaching out to our entire EB Digest community for this event on Monday. So if you are signed up, you will not miss the Monday free educational uh, seminar or webinar on candlesticks. And candlesticks to me, I've, I've always said, give me the charts. I want the price volume. I got to have price volume and give me candlesticks. I need to visualize what's taking place in the market. Those are two necessities for me to trade. I don't. I wouldn't want to trade without candlesticks. So anyway, check out that uh, EB Digest, make sure you signed up and then uh, come see me on Monday, 4.30 p.m. It's the first of four. We're gonna have four free, uh, it's free Mondays at earnings beats in terms of the education. So four Mondays in a row. First, eighth, fifteenth, twenty-second, four different topics, and they'll all be free. Um, trying to give back to the community, help folks understand what CNBC will never tell you. Of course, I had to get one CNBC 
little tidbit in there. Um, but anyway, let's move on to the VIX. So I talked about the VIX earlier saying that it was giving signals that things are, are looking even better for stocks. One thing that I had noticed, and again, secondary indicator, and one thing, not huge, but as prices, normally what you see, prices go up, VIX goes down. Prices go down, VIX goes up. Price goes up, VIX goes down. Pretty simple, right? Well, what I was seeing throughout this year is as we were going up in price action, I know it's just past 9.30, I'm getting ready to wrap up here. Um, but just as we we're going higher and higher, look at what the VIX was doing. I mean, the lows were rising. So, I mean, it's rising down the 12, 13 range. So it, that's different than rising in the 20 to 22 range. But nonetheless, fear has been building slightly while prices are going up. And that makes me nervous thinking that, hey, we might struggle if we get any bad news. We could, I could see maybe a little pop and maybe that's what happened right here in February when we had the pop, the pop in the VIX. We saw the market pull back for probably the biggest pullback we've had in 2024. It may have been the result of the VIX building just a little bit and then having a, a big move. I think that was... I think that was the CPI when the CPI came out um, in February. That was January CPI. Anyway, um, the prices continued going up on the S&P, but look what happened. The VIX actually broke this slightly rising trend line. Um, and that tells me that the fear now is starting to head back in the direction that we want to accompany a bull market advance to the upside. So that little minor move right there just takes one a uh, secondary indicator that I probably would have said, you know, saying, you know, maybe we need to be a little careful and it just wiped it out. So another one of the bearish thoughts that were way, 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 way back here in the back of my head, or that, that thought's gone. And the VIX is a short term. I mean, the VIX doesn't mark a long, it doesn't tell us that there's a long term bear market coming. A lot of times when that that's going up like that, it's just telling us that in the short term, we may not be able to handle some news very well. Um, that's the way I think about it. That's the way I interpret it. Anyway, uh, all good there. Um, last thing I want to mention is earlier we talked about Lulu and the fact that it was holding back clothing and accessories. Just wanted to show you that chart. This is They actually beat top line, beat bottom line. I'm pretty sure they beat both. Um, but I think their guidance may have been a little lighter than what was expected. The market, I mean, it was trading at 480. Now it's at 390. I'll give you an update because we just opened. And we're up a little bit today, 394. Um, but this is just telling me that, well, it's not telling me anything just yet. Obviously, we've broken down. But what I would look at on something like Lululemon is look back, look at this gap support where we gapped up on massive volume right in here. This came from about the 375 level. Maybe that's where we're heading. So on this downtrend, I'm anticipating if I wanted to buy it, what am I anticipating? Reversing candle would help off of this huge move lower. If we were to get down below 375, maybe print a hammer, come back up, close above 375, right at gap support, that might be a good time to take a, a, a shot at a short-term trade. Now, normally I'm not going to focus on stocks that are beaten up like this. I normally look on up look at, for uptrending stocks, but Lululemon's one of those stocks, if you look at a long-term chart, Let's go out 15 years on the monthly. Pretty darn good stock. And what history tells us is that when we get pullbacks, they tend to be great buys on this stock. So if you have those exceptions, Apple would be one. You know, obviously there are a lot of them, many of the, the Magnificent Seven um, or the Old Fang, whatever you want to call them. Uh, those stocks have long term uptrends. So when they pull back, they tend to be viable. If you look at other stocks and they just go up and down like this, when they pull back, you don't know where they're going. So I have no interest in, in those types of stocks. So anyhow, just wanted to finish up with that. Let's see what the market's doing. Uh, just again, still holding on to some so-so gains. I mean, Dow flat, S&P 500 up a little more than a quarter percent, NASDAQ up a half percent, small caps up maybe about six tenths of 1%. So one of the first things I like to do is go in here especially because I follow the IWM so closely and just see what's going on. We are back over 207, got as high as 207.63. Remember the breakout is a close above 208.21.
Now, to me, 208.22, technically it's a breakout, wouldn't be the same as 209 or 210. So, you know, the further it gets through and breaks out, the more comfortable I'm going to feel about that breakout. But right now, still got some work to do on the IWM. The other thing I do, and I always talk about this in the trading room when we do that, that's coming up tomorrow, by the way. Um, and if you're a 30-day trial member to our paid service, you can come in for our, to our trading room tomorrow. But anyway, one of the first things I like to do with the market when it first opens, and sometimes I'll just take a quick snapshot, but right now we have discretionary technology and communication services leading this advance. That makes me feel pretty good about this. Financials and industrials. So five of the top six sectors are the aggressive groups to start out the day. If that continues and we continue to see money rotating into those areas, that's a signal that the bull market's alive and kicking, number one, but it's also a sustainability uh, sign. So this is telling me that if we're moving up and these groups are leading, probably going to keep going up. Anyway, we'll end on that. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, again, uh, next Monday, candlestick course. Um, that's April 1st. It's not an April Fool's joke. It's real. Um, it's going to be a, a really good course. I'm going to teach you all the things that I've learned about candlesticks. I'm going to teach you all the things I use, all the, the secrets, all the, the signals that these candlesticks give me to trade or to get out of trades. You know, one question that I always get, when do you sell? That seems to be the one question that no one seems to be able to answer. Well, I can tell you candlesticks, that's one reason that it'll beat you over the head to sell if you understand their signals. Anyway, all of that coming up on Monday. So please check that out. If you like what we do here at Earnings Beats, hit the like button, please. Uh, we'd love that. Subscribe to our channel. These are things that are that'll really help us non-financially um, right here on YouTube. So uh, we'd love to have that support from you. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.